Thank you for being here. And now I would like to introduce our executive director, Leonard Garfield, who's going to give a little bit more information and context about tonight. Well, great. Thank you, Rachel. And I'll second your greetings to everyone and a warm welcome to our community conversation tonight, Democracy in the Age of Pandemic and Protest. We have a really amazing panel of individuals who are truly on the front lines of the democratic experiment. So I know we're all looking forward to both a lively and enlightening discussion. Tonight's conversation is part of Mohai's larger initiative called Stand Up Seattle, the Democracy Project. We're spending the next few months promoting civic literacy historic exploration and present day engagement. And as with tonight's program, we're presenting a variety of civic and political leaders and organizations who represent many perspectives. We hope you'll continue to join us for these programs as we go through the election season all the way into March of 2021. And we're also especially excited today because we are launching our online version of the exhibit, Stand Up Seattle, the Democracy Project. You'll be able to see the real uh, in-person exhibit when we open the museum later this year, hopefully with uh, public health holding. But right now you can enjoy that exhibit in an online version. A link is going to be sent to you in a direct email following this program. Uh, so look for that, or you can just go to mohite.org and check it out. Before I, we formally launch the program tonight, I want to take a moment, as we always do in every MOHAI program, whether we're gathered in person or gathering virtually, and that is to recognize that we are on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. We acknowledge the forced displacement of those native communities from this land, but we also honor the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. In our project Stand Up Seattle, we talk about native sovereignty. It's an issue that lies at the very heart of the democratic experiment here in the Northwest. And in that context, to this day, the Duwamish people have yet to receive federal recognition from the United States government. I encourage you to visit the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center in West Seattle to learn more. If you have not been there, I, I do hope you'll put that on your list of, of must do things in, in the weeks and months to come. I also want to take note that we are holding this program in a time of unprecedented protests against police violence towards black people, that Mohai states unequivocally that black lives matter, and that leads us to tonight's conversation. I feel that we are so lucky to have as our moderator, Enrique Cerna. Enrique has been hosting community conversations with Mohai for, I think four or five years, Enrique will, will remind me, but they're always amazing. I think Enrique has probably interviewed more thinkers and more doers of democracy than anyone in our region. And just this week helped celebrate the 95th birthday of Governor Dan Evans. Um, so we are in good hands with a moderator like Enrique Cerna. He's a journalist with more than four decades of experience. He has won nine regional Emmy Awards, many, many other honors. And in March, Enrique was appointed by Governor Inslee to the Board of Regents of Washington State University. So it is a great pleasure and an honor to introduce our moderator for this evening's program, Enrique Cerna. Thank you very much, Leonard, and go Cougs. Uh, those of you who are Cougs out there, and I hope there are some Cougs out there. I'm very, very honored to be here with you this evening to uh, be a part of what I think is going to be uh, an important and it's a very timely conversation about democracy amidst a pandemic, actually two pandemics, uh, COVID-19 and racism, and which has uh, moved thousands to protest the shooting of black men and women and also other people of color. We have an excellent panel that's going to join us this evening. Uh, but before we get to those voices, uh, we're going to begin with a conversation that I recorded recently with Larry Gossett. Larry is a icon in Seattle and Martin Luther King County, uh, social justice icon. He's also a former King County Council member from 1993 to 2019. And we had, uh, I think, an interesting conversation about his take on how things are today and during these uncertain times, and particularly as we're wondering, what is the state of our democracy? Let's look at that conversation. So as you look at uh, our uh, country today, what's your take? and our democracy. 
the democratic movement that I like best that's going on now in our nation uh, was unfortunately, uh, or is unfortunately, the fallout from the murder of George Floyd. I was very pleased, Enrique, with the fallout that occurred in every single state in this nation as a result of that over brutal, very visible because of it. And there's intersectionality with COVID-19 because so many of us were at home as you and I are this morning, a Tuesday morning, uh, uh, because of that, uh, because of the pandemic that's hit the whole world. But at any rate, we saw the visible uh, killing of this black man by the police officers. And there was a re immediate response in, uh, in Minnesota. And in about three days, all 50 states had demonstrations. We've always professed that our desire is to create a nation where all men and women are created equally, who are treated in an equitable, fair, just, and democratic fashion. We just, in this country, have never been able uh, to get there. And caste, class, and race have, have been significant impediments. When it comes to democracy, though, um, are you hopeful or not so much? I am now three quarters of a century old, Enrique, and I really do think that in the United States, uh, we'll get to a much truer level of democracy, but it might not be uh, it, uh, in my lifetime, because I'm getting on up there, but I really think, and what gives me inspiration to say this to you, is the 50 state demonstrations, uh, 50 state wide uh, demonstrations, uh, they were militant, peaceful, but certainly directed toward creating a fuller democracy, not based on caste, or race, or gender, or sexual orientation, divisions that currently uh, still exist uh, in our society and still have, you know, pretty massive uh, followings. What are the parallels that you see with 1968, a uh, time of upheaval in this country? But it yeah. was a time, too, when you really started to get involved as an activist. What right. do you see the parallels of, of that time and today? Uh, many of the things that I just said to you, I would have said then. In 1968, 69, I was the president of the University of Washington Black Student Union. And uh, with that title and supported by uh, 20... 25 black students at the UW out of a total of 63. Uh, we moved with confidence that we could create, uh, and this was the beginning of the black power movement, that we were actually capable of creating black power in this society. And we were confident that we could get black people from all the sectors of the black community involved in this effort. And if you look at, if you go back and look at our demands, we were confident that we could get, if we're well organized, if we're unselfish, if we had an ideology, a set of ideas that led us, where we encouraged and tried to figure out ways of involving other peoples, we were confident by the time we were 25 that the revolution would come. And, you know, just for me, telling you that we were a little off on the date. As activists in the Black Student Union at the UW, as activists in the Black Panther Party in Seattle, uh, the parallel that I could see with today is that we had people that were willing to come to demonstrations on, on school campuses. 
uh, in the streets of Seattle, both against the vestiges of institutionalized overt or not so overt racism that existed in Seattle. We could get thousands of people on the street around the war. In 1968, I can't, I mean, I can't, it, it just wasn't as racially and sector, I, mean, I guess I mean class, uh, racial and class um, uh, diverse uh, than as it has become uh, now. You know, it seems to me that what we're seeing today is a real generational shift, something that, you know, I would like to have seen when I was uh, in my 20s or 30s. I like the fact that they intuitively uh, don't have a big problem with working with others. Uh, the, the amount of discussion and time uh, the University of Washington Black Student Union and the Black Panther Party, uh, the organization that I was involved in in 68, had to spend on we have to work with other sectors of the population was significant compared to now when you say we have to uh, get involved with other sectors of the population. You were a part of the Gang of Four. Yes. With Bob Santos, Bernie White Bear, and Roberto Maestas. Um, yes, sir. What can the young activists of today, what do you want them to take away from how the uh, four of you work together? I love teaching those lessons to the young people that are coming along now or even older people that just are now getting involved in the uh, movement because they're inspirational. They show that multi-ethnic organizing and unity can bring about more change than just operating by ourselves, uh, and although sometimes that's necessary, uh, or just organizing from you know, one sector of the population. You tend to do better when you get support from other sectors, particularly other sectors that have been disadvantaged or other sectors like white youth or white students that just see that they want a more true democracy in their nation and they're tired uh, of having to put signs in the yard that says Black Lives Matter. Why not create uh, uh, real institutional change that manifests that Black lives and Asian lives and Native and um, Pacific Islander uh, and Latino lives and white lives, they all matter. Thank you. Our thanks to Larry Gossett for uh, sharing his thoughts. Uh, he's someone that has been here for many years and has been through the wars and continues to uh, continues to be active in the effort to bring social justice and uh, equality to uh, Martin Luther King County. And thank you, Larry. Really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of our program this evening. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce our panel members. And as I do, uh, I'd like them to uh, reveal themselves uh, uh, on video. Uh, let me begin with David Domke. David is a professor in the Department of Communi Communication at the University of Washington. His work is focused on communication, politics, and public opinion in the United States. He's one of the leaders of Common Power, a civic action organization in Seattle that works toward voting justice in partnerships across the country. Good to have you with us, David. Thank you very much for being here. Also, uh, let me uh, bring on Charles Douglas III, he is a Tacoma native and a former Starbucks e-commerce marketer who led the launch of Common Power as a uh, professional political action organization in 2018. He now manages elements of the marketing, fieldwork, and strategy for the organization. Also, also with us tonight is Omari Salisbury. Omari is uh, a citizen journalist. He's also the founder of Converge Media. 
He is from a very prominent Seattle family that uh, his family started the very first black owned photography studio in the Northwest that was based here in Seattle. His mother and father are very active in, in the community. Want to make sure that his mom gets acknowledged so she doesn't chew me out, right? All right, right Omari? All right, that's right. Okay, we're covered there. Omari hails from a long line of storytellers. Um, he has traveled the world. He's worked as a global citizen, working in media across the continent of Africa, the Middle East, and Europe, 52 countries and counting, I believe. Also with us this evening is Nikita Oliver, Seattle-based creative community organizer, abolitionist, educator, and attorney. Nikita is the co-executive director of Creative Justice, an arts-based alternative to incarceration and a healing, engaged, youth-led community-based program. Nikita organizes with no, no uh, new youth jail, Decriminalize Seattle, King County Equity Now, and the Seattle People's Party, and she's one heck of a, of a spoken word artist. I want to mention that as well. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And Nikita, I want to start with you. I'm going to have you unmute yourself. I, I want you to um, weigh in on your thoughts about our democracy today. Do you think it's Yeah, yeah. I, I go first. Wow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've, I've been thinking about this, this question uh, quite a bit, and we say we are in a democracy, but, uh, you know, really, in my opinion, we're in a plutocracy. We are in a space where an elite or ruling class of people whose powers derive from their wealth often are uh, not just in the elected positions, but run the corporations, the lobbying institutions, all of the things that decide the legal framework of the space that we live in. And it, it feels like, especially during this global pandemic, living in a tech city, money and corporations have more influence uh, on our everyday lives, including our elections, than they ever had before. That being said, uh, I also think we're in one of the most democratic times of my short 34 years. Uh, protests and specifically movements of people in organizing are really key to establishing a true, strong, healthy democracy. People feeling they have the right to voice what they need and what they want um, in a way that aligns with the First Amendment it is just really a key part of, of when we talk about the U.S. as a democracy. Um, and, and movements have often made changes long before people like Black folks and women had the right to vote, you know, the abolition of slavery, child labor laws, um, Clean Water Act. There, there are so many wins that we've had that changed the terrain that we were in before many folks had the ability to change the players on that terrain. So uh, the other piece of that for me is, you know, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was essentially gutted in 2013 by the, the U.S. Supreme Court. And we are still presently very much in major fights for fair elections all over the country. Um, and even in the chat prior before us even starting, people are already asking, what is the safest way for me to turn in my ballot? And right. that is a terrifying thing in a space that in a, in a place where we think we are a democracy. That should not be a question that people ask. It, it should be inherently safe to turn in your ballot. And um, now I'll finish with this. There's also so many communities that are disenfranchised both historically and presently from voting, whether or not we're talking about residents, or undocumented folks, formerly incarcerated people, communities of color, folks that are economically disenfranchised. And so um, as, as someone who in a very short life here has witnessed many, many wars fought under the auspice of bringing democracy to other nations, it is both disturbing and ironic to be in the space that we are, where in many ways, I think people are deeply questioning our democracy and how true and established it really is. Well, Mario, I wanna to go to you next. Uh, you have been so busy over the past year uh, covering what's been happening in the streets as a citizen journalist and uh, where we've seen democracy through protests. Uh, so what's your take? What do you think? How's our democracy doing out there? Can you, can you, you have mute yourself, please? Uh, thank you. Good evening. And thank you to everybody who's joining. First off, before I answer your question, I mean, I, I have to pay homage to our, to our elder and a mentor, uh, Larry Gossett, who opened the show um, this evening. You know, it's, it's upon people like Larry Gossett's shoulders that many of us, especially from the Central District, stand upon. And actually a good segue when you talk about what's happening here in the streets. And maybe, you know, we can put some history together for a lot of people who are new to Seattle and don't really understand. 
what we what we're kind of seeing right now when you see people like uh, Nikita Oliver and different groups in the streets. Let's take it back to when Larry Gossett was out there years ago. Larry Gossett went to went to jail in 1968 for leading a sit-in at Franklin High School because the uh, the principal of the school sent two girls home, told them they needed to straighten their hair. Larry Gossett served jail time up there on the top of the King County Courthouse. 25 years later, he became a King County Council member. Let's also talk about during that time period where uh, housing or the, the, the um, you had housing covenants that were in place here all the way through the 60s where black people and people of color were restricted to where they could live. It took major organizing and, and, and sit-ins. People did sit-ins down there at the mayor's office, which, which actually launched the Office of Civil Rights here in Seattle. In the mid-60s, the whole city of Seattle voted for to, to open up basically the, the fair housing ordinance in Seattle. Voters in Seattle voted that down because they wanted to keep Seattle segregated. I bring this up because people always have a misnomer of this great liberal city that we've always lived in, which is a misnomer. It wasn't until three weeks after the assassination of Dr. King in 1968 that Seattle passed an ordinance opening up housing for everybody. Let's take it to transit. You know, for, for years, uh, Seattle Transit, it became Metro in 1973. They didn't think that the black community in the Central District deserved a crosstown bus, a bus that went north and south. If you lived in the CD, you had to go down town if you wanted to go to the U district, if you wanted to go south. It took months of organizing, which is real interesting what's happening right now, because Seattle Transit said that it wouldn't be a profitable route, and they said that all their other routes would, would had way more traffic and would be profitable. What people did there in the 60s is they did their own research, kind of like what we're hearing these guys doing now, and they put, they, uh, um, they put riders on all the buses on Seattle Transit and gathered all the ridership and research information and, and kind of proved that Seattle Transit at the time was being disingenuous. And then on top of that, they threatened a boycott. And it took all of that to be able to get a cross-town bus to go, and it's called the number 48 for people who know and love Seattle, but the 48, it's one of the longest and heavily used routes. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of things. When you talk about people like uh, King County Equity now, whether you agree with them or not, the fact that they're like, we're going to do our own research, you just go back to when Larry Gossett was, 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 was young and running the streets. That's exactly what they had to do to be able to get, a, a, you know, bus service. It's exactly when you talk about sit-ins, they were doing that years ago. So, you know, a, a bigger question is almost as well, as well as how much has Seattle actually changed with this, the, the liberal persona that we put out there at the city, which has never been. One last footnote here before answering your question. Um, the Supreme Court the other day, when they um, when they now I I nine seven six the I men with the with the tabs, they went and, and and corrected a wrong in history from sixty years ago. Sixty years ago, here very liberal Seattle, it was the Price family. They went to bury their infant son in a cemetery here in Seattle. And they wanted to bury their baby in an area of a cemetery called Babyland. And guess what? Babyland was segregated. And for 60 years, that ruling kind of stayed on the books. And it was just the Supreme Court just righted that wrong a few days ago. So in, in a sense, the, the fight for democracy here in the Emerald City has never really uh, gone away. It's just ebbed and flowed kind of over the years. It's just ebbed and flowed. And it's amazing that you have a, a giant like like Larry Gossett to open the the, the show. And you, you got some of us younger folks on here and you can almost tell the same stories what Larry Gossett was telling with the same movement that we're seeing right here on the ground today. You know, one of the people that uh, uh, was part of that protest with him way back when at Franklin High School was Roberto Maestas, who was a Spanish teacher then. And, uh, and he was the one that joined them, a uh, precursor to Larry and, and Roberto becoming very close friends. And then Roberto and others that took over Beacon Hill School that now has become El Centro de la Raza. And by the way, uh, we'll be talking about that on another Mohai program next Wednesday night about El Centro. So I hope folks will join us then as well. And Larry will be a part of that. So let's move on. Um, David, I'm going to go to you and uh, give me your, your thoughts about what you've heard here. But also, uh, as you have uh, been out there with Charles working uh, about this, to see where people are coming from out you know, during this time of, uh, and, and what do you think? Is our democracy just hanging on? Yes. It's, uh, it's actually uh, been hanging on ever since the beginning because the fundamental folks who, uh, who are supposed to have a say in it all never were given the shot. So we're, we're perhaps 
uh, arguably in, in a horrible kind of way, closer than we've ever been to a, to a true democratic space. But it's taken millions of lives and uh, organizing and work by countless folks, um, but particularly people of color uh, to, do, to get us to where we're at. So hanging on, uh, I would say that we, the struggle has always been there. And it, it has particularly been there been born by folks who have been excluded from a just and inclusive democracy, which is part of the work that Charles and I are committed to through voting work, through voter work. Um, it's always been an exclusionary process. What's happening, I believe now, right now, let's take the last mm, 15 years, maybe we could peg it to the, the Iraq war and the protests that began around the Iraq war, is that a much more uh, diverse a much more technologically sophisticated, a much more highly educated body of folks um, have moved into positions of leadership in, in, uh, in, in our kind of organizing circles and in newer institutions. So uh, the University of Washington, where I've been fortunate to be for two decades, and I'm on, I'm on leave at this time to do work with Common Power and expect to do that for a long, long time. Um, is not leading the fight on these matters, but that's not a, really a critique of them, although it could be, but that's a different topic. Um, it's, it's reality is that other organizations that are starting with highly educated folks who have strategies, but are also able to organize those pieces together, educated, which means they've learned the lessons of the past, um, are, are strategic in how they do the work and also um, have that technological facility. That's a very powerful combination, all right, really powerful. Our media systems, for example, are not controlled and centralized in the way they used to be back in, in the 1960s. And that in itself has been a transformative piece. So I, I, ne I never want to say like this is a good time to be alive because this is a horrible time to be here right now, all right? But the reality is that the progress that, that I get to contribute to and that people who are making this work move forward um, has probably been closer than it's ever been that to, to what this country so ideally said it was going to be. And that's, that really just speaks to how far we've had to go just to get here because we know we have a long way to go still. Right. Charles, I want to uh, bring you in and ask you about uh, if you could give us a little more background on Common Power. But also, uh, Nikita brought up the fact that, oh, and he's got to unmute too. Uh, uh, but uh, Nikita brought up that uh, we, we, we had a question earlier. People are worried about, uh, you know, are their ballots safe? And can, is it safe for them to put it in a ballot box? Or what can you tell them? And you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I want to start first by saying that uh, I could have listened to Brother Gossett go on for this entire time. Um, uh, seeing elders like him is is really moving to me, and it it reminds us that it's our turn. It's our turn. Um, my my dad was a was a Black Panther out of Oakland, and um, he fled when he was a, a teenager to come up here and, and uh, start some stuff down at Tacoma. Uh, but one of the things he reminds me of when I get doom and gloom about what's going on now is, is what Omari was talking about, is that they had it much worse back then. Um, and we have made, made progress. Um, so I agree with what everyone else is saying, but I also say that it, it's taken a lot of heroic behavior on the part of folks locally and nationally uh, to fix this, to uh, have disadvantaged communities be heard, um, to build the, the infrastructure on the progressive side uh, that we need, uh, not just in 2020, but after this. And also, a system is broken if it requires heroes. Our system should not require heroes. Um, so, so, yes, our democracy is broken. We see that now uh, more than ever. And, um, it, it's, it, and still, it's looking promising going forward now. Should you be scared right now? Totally. You have every right to be worried about what's going on with your vote. And also, if you're in Washington State, you probably have some of the least amount of worries when it comes to your votes. Um, we have seen more bipartisanship at high levels here around voting and protecting the vote, Democrats and Republicans, in a way that is exemplary. Um, and so if you're here, 
you're fine either way, I think, here in Washington State. Now, everywhere else in the country, in the 24, 25 states now that Common Power is working in, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and states like Georgia and Texas, where our, our folks are calling right now, states like Colorado even, that have uh, pretty much universal mail-in in voting. Uh, we're on the phone and on text messages today, my family working there. So um, there's, there's a ton of work to do. There's a lot of states out there that need our help, and that's why Common Power transfers the abundance of, of progressive energy we have over to these places that need a little bit more. Uh, I'm sort of shocked, well, maybe I shouldn't be, but what's have been happening in Texas uh, over the efforts there by the governor to limit the uh, um, boxes uh, the, to deliver ballots, and then also the fact that a federal, uh, first there was a federal ruling to stop that, then there was uh, another ruling to an appeals court that then is allowing it to yet to happen. Um, but that, that bothers me, but yet then I see these lines of people, of uh, people just, they're willing to, you know, they want to vote. So in some respects, I see democracy working. It seems to be working. So what do you think? I mean, is it a good sign or Nikita, what do you think? Yeah, you know, and it, it might be where I'm at generationally. There are a lot of folks in my age group asking, does their vote matter? Yeah. And I think this is where the integrity of, of process, the impact of money and elections, the way in which uh, lobbying works, how hard it is for everyday people to run for office. I know we, we lift up um, Acacia Cortez as like this beautiful example of someone with lived experience coming from disenfranchised communities and getting into office, but her fight to get there was, was incredibly challenging. Um, just to fund the campaign, the lack of access to health care or salary. I mean, when she got into office, she didn't have money for an apartment in D.C., right? So I think there are so many components of the way in which, and, and again, I, I hold that we live in a plutocracy and not a democracy, um, the way in which the lack of integrity and process, the inaccessibility, not just to be able to vote, but to participate um, and becoming an elected official for my age group is a very challenging thing to navigate because a lot of folks between the ages of 18 and I would say maybe 40 don't believe their vote counts. And I think that that is part of the problem of, 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 of the struggle here of, of actually firmly establishing our democracy. Of course, Washington is not as bad as some Southern, southern states, but I take issue with the measuring stick uh, conversation. If, if we have not established 100% integrity, we still have a very serious problem. And that, that's part of what we're seeing now. On the flip side of that, I also hear folks in my generation saying things like, folks, folks died for you to have the right to vote. So voting is your minimal uh, contribution to being civil, civically engaged. And I don't, I don't disagree with that either. I, I agree. Many people gave their lives um, for me to have the right to vote. Uh, that being said, if, if we cannot figure out how to establish integrity in the process, as well as accessibility to even be a part of our government as an elected official, I think people are going to continue to question the effectiveness of democracy or even its existence within the United States. Uh, anybody want to take up this question? I, I did pose it earlier, but it's the, the one question that's being asked here is, and I'm going to throw this out now, is that are we safer to put ballots in the mail or in a ballot box? I'm going to say ballot box, but that's, uh, what do you think? David? Sure. Uh, I'll say ballot box. Absolutely, because there is a process that's supposedly in place for the collection, the monitoring, the safety of that, that doesn't require as many transfer of hands as a, a mail-in ballot, doesn't require as many people and things that can go wrong. Um, that said, our systems of voter uh, processing of ballots, by and large in this country, um, are, are, are monitored by many folks whether those monitoring folks carry out their, their jobs 
is the bigger issue that I think Nikita is getting at. It's not that we don't have a system. It's that the systems that are there don't necessarily carry them through with the kind of confidence that we want. And then there's a whole bunch of folks, and unfortunately, this is a partisan endeavor in our country right now, who are trying to even stop people from getting the right to cast the vote. So I think like the ability to to think about a vote is, is, is there an integrity in the processing of it? Is it going to make a difference in the big picture? Do I even get to do it? Those are all fundamentally intersecting lines, but require really different ac avenues of action. Okay. And so ultimately we need all of these different lanes to be working hard because that's how bad it is right now. Omari, you want to weigh in? Omari, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've, I've moved around a lot in the last few months, and really, I mean, that's it's a crazy statement. You, there's no blanket answer to that. In Martin Luther King County here in Seattle, I mean, the, the ballot box or probably the mail is cool. And a lot of other places, it's like, man, I would, I would go with the box. I was just down there in Houston, and, you know, it's a lot of people who that's why they're waiting in line, everything else. They're, they're, they're wanting to put it, you know, in a, in a secure place, which is unfortunate. But, you know, I can speak for our city, our county. What I see here is I would tell people go put it in the ballot box if you live in King County or even I think the boxes are deployed across the state of Washington. Put it in the ballot box. What, when you were down in Houston, tell me what you saw. Did you see folks out standing? Well, the well I mean, the, the biggest thing that we see is, and, and, and I can really even relate it here back to Seattle, is people are energized about the system. Now, whether it's a whole nother, I mean, about, about this process right now and, and about voting. Now, whether, you know, the democracy is working or not working, maybe a separate kind of discussion than the fact that people are engaged. What we find here on Converge is that man, our biggest, some of our biggest programs are stuff people wouldn't watch a few years ago. Our, some of our biggest programs is, is me and Kevin Schofield talking about the technicalities of legislation. Like we, 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 we did a show, we, we, we do reaction shows, the city council votes. And people, these are the, these are the biggest shows. And it's a lot of times I'll look through there, I'll see people who I know personally have had no interest in, in politics, no interest in whatever, and they're totally engaged. And we keep adding more political analysis shows on Converge. That wasn't even our, our whole, that wasn't even a direction that we were going. But what we see is that people are switched on. So no matter what, what the, what's going on right now, whatever it is, has turned people on to the process. People are, are, are digging deep into the process. People who were never engaged before are engaged. People who we never thought that would be consuming political shows, of, like I said, about, about how a bill passes. You know, we, we did a countdown. Will, will Mayor, Mayor Jenny uh, or veto the bill? And all these people are tuning in. And then we had the post veto show. And all these people, I, I think Nikita joined us on one of those shows. So after the 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 um the city council overturned the veto, and this is view like real viewership that's coming in there, and so I would say that people are energized about what's going on, and right now in this moment, a lot of people who maybe slept through a civics, failed civics, or was never taught civics, man, there's a fast learning curve, and they're trying to learn everything they can about the process. Yeah, well, civics isn't taught in schools anymore. So, you know, I think people are looking. I think that also says something about uh, local journalism. The fact that, uh, you know, there is a need to have these things covered, which I think, you know, Converge is doing, which I'm happy to see that happen. Uh, but also the struggle that it is to keep journalism alive and well, local journalism especially, to be able to cover those things. But yet we need them. Uh, I, but I also have to say that I'm somewhat heartened by the fact that we've already had millions of people that are involved in early voting. So it's this really kind of a I don't know, it's a, it's a complex thing with our, the state of our democracy. On one hand, we see all of these things happening, but yet we also have candidates that we know uh, that are also just tearing down the system and questioning it and, and raising so much uh, uh, chaos. I guess that maybe that, that's, that's what we're really dealing with so much with these days with our democracy. You guys want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I mean, so early voting, and this is something that we're tracking on a daily basis. And um, it, it's, I, I think we're upwards of, David, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like 23 million people had voted as of yesterday or something like that. 
um, uh, states like Texas are at like 40% of their population, or excuse me, the, the, the folks that voted in 2016 have already voted now. Um, we had this idea of, of election season as opposed to election day. And we, we thought for sure on November 3rd, we wouldn't know any of the, any of the results. Uh, the way that voting is looking right now, we could actually know there could be more people who vote before election day than on election day. And we could know a lot about some of these results on November 3rd. Uh, and that, that's really exciting. Uh, that folks are turning out. People are working to get other people to turn out. People are making phone calls all over the place, not just CP. Uh, and then we're seeing in our, in our businesses. And again, this is not, this is not a government, it should not be a government uh, a, a system, it should not be on companies to tell us when to vote and how to vote and to provide us all these avenues, uh, but they're doing it. Social media everywhere, all the apps that my kids use are, are all pointing them towards where they could register to vote or check their registration. Uh, enthusiasm is to the roof. Now, can we harness this? That's the thing. Uh, common power is formed and not just for 2020. In fact, the only reason why I left my job to do this full time was with the promise that we would never take our eye off the ball again and we would stay active every single year, large elections and small, uh, in states that you know about like Wisconsin and, and places you've never heard of in um, backwater areas in Oklahoma. Um, we're gonna stay active in this because the reason why we're here is because we went back to our lives. And really what we should be doing is all watch and converge and learn from this brother on a regular basis. We should, this should be a part of, of being small C citizen uh, not just in Washington State, but around the country. I agree. I agree with that. Um, let's talk a little bit about how COVID has affected our democracy and what it's maybe telling us uh, right now. I, I think in some respects, COVID, um, while it, it helped us understand all the racial disparities there are, particularly when it comes to health care, but I think also then when the protests started after the George Floyd shooting, um, that it... I, I, it, I think it, to some degree, because so many people were at home, uh, it got them, I think it made him brought about a real change in dealing with racial justice in our country. Thoughts on that? David? Anybody? Sure, I'll take a, I'll take a stab at the issue of COVID and, and what I think it's done for our democracy or, or for whatever we call this thing that we have. Um, <laughs> I would say that it's, it's a bit of a truth serum for us is what it is, is that it, it's, uh, it's revealed things that, uh, that were there that we know are real, but yet establishments and institutions um, and people who don't have a voice all combined together, we're not able to bring to the fore, but given the right serum, all of a sudden it becomes vocalized and articulated in ways that, that we can't ignore anymore. So this is about black and brown people being victimized more than other folks. This is about frontline healthcare workers not having the support that they need to have in our society. They're about educational institutions uh, not having any answer to date really for, the, for this moment and the inequity is getting worse because of that, right? So would COVID have done something very different if we had a different president who took science seriously and uh, deferred to folks? I, I think yes, but would it, have, would, it have ignored, would it have somehow not dealt with any of these things? No, it would not. We would have fewer people dead, I believe, um, and we'd be farther along. But the fact that my two kids in public schools um, are able to have the, the resources that I'm able to provide to them versus others, and I can help to provide those, but I just can't get them to them in the same way, is, is really revealed in this way, in a way that our educational system was actually, it was that way all the way through. It just wasn't being manifested quite the same way. Yeah. If I, if I could just add on to that, Enrique, from, from a media perspective, what, what COVID did is, is that it gave people People went, you know, in, in this business, it went from sound bites. We've never been, we've always been long format, but you know, the format before COVID was sound bites because that's all you can, people, oh, it needs to be a two minute read. It needs to be digestible content and everything else. And what we found is that people like us who were always into a longer format, people now had time to consume. People had time to listen to a whole 
30 minute interview with uh, with a Nikita Oliver or even a 30 minute interview with a Mayor Durkin where before it's like, oh, well, we just have time for a sound bite or something else. And so what we have found is that like the consumption of content, not only our content, but I'm sure all the way across is that people are consuming more and they're learning more um, about, about what's out there. Now, what actions they take beyond that, that, you know, they would know best. But what we saw during COVID is that um, one, for all, you know, online or broadcast, people consume more, but two, also being out there at the, at the Western Barricade and early on in the protest, a lot of those people, so it was people who was out there, George Floyd, for sure, a lot of those people, it was general anger. Some people, man, they still hadn't gotten uh, an unemployment check. Remember, unemployment, it crashed, 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 but there was no front line for people who were getting beat down by COVID. There was no, no, no front line. And when the Western Barricade went up, up on Capitol Hill, you found that it was people who were fighting for, for, for social justice, but, and they were joined by people who had been beat down by COVID. And, you know, they were out there. And even the memorial wall, the, the candlelight vigil, there was, sit, there was candlelight vigil there, and people would light candles for, for George Floyd or for people who had, who had uh, passed away for, for police violence. You found that some people were there and they were, they were lighting candles for loved ones who died from COVID. They couldn't go to the funeral and they just wanted to be around other people who were feeling a sense of mourning and a sense of loss. And so that's something else that we saw with, with COVID mixing in with the protest as well. Nikita, you weigh in uh, because you've been so involved and really kind of trying to bring the change um, in reaction to the protests that have been going on in locally. Yeah, you know, um, COVID-19 exasperated the pre-existing conditions of inequity that, that already existed. Uh, some of those conditions that had not visibly impacted some white communities in a long time, and COVID-19 really exposed economic inequality. Uh, the, the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, um, Manuel uh, Ellis in Tacoma exposed the need for racial justice. Simultaneously in Seattle, uh, all across the coast, we're seeing smoke coming. So there's an ecological crisis happening and we're in the midst of an economic depression. We have not seen a convergence of these kinds of issues, honestly, since the 1960s when MLK was assassinated and you saw the labor movement meet the racial justice movement. And there started to be a major convergence of everyone impacted by white supremacy and racialized capitalism in the United States and globally. So I think we're seeing like an incredibly significant time that hasn't come back presently since, since really the 1960s and early 1970s, uh, which is really powerful. It meant that while COVID is terrifying and deadly at the same time, it created a very strange space for a convergence of justice issues that in my opinion have always been and will always be interrelated. And if we cannot get the 99% to stand against the 1%, we'll continue to find ourselves in this cycle every 50 to 60 years. That being said, while I think the protests, the engagement, all of those things has been incredibly powerful. I, I have a very real fear as we approach this election. Um, after the vice president debate, the, the, pres the vice presidential debate, what disturbed me was that people were not talking about the issues. So while Biden and Harris feel like the answer right now to fascism, Biden and Harris actually stand in opposition to some of the largest movements that are happening. They're not for the Green New Deal and both support policing as it stands. So what's terrifying is that there might be those who suddenly feel safer when Biden and Harris win, and as a result may not be in the streets or as a participating in democracy or being as civically engaged after this election, which would, would actually be a huge problem because it's what we saw happen during the Obama administration was Obama won and people suddenly were like, look, the first black president, we don't have to stand up and fight anymore. And yet we saw so many murders of black people during that time. We saw a drone program start. We saw the deportation of more people, of more um, folks than any other president prior to Trump. And so uh, one of my fears is that we will get so uh, 
we, we will be happy when Biden and Harris win because we feel like we will have averted fascism and then suddenly people will feel comfortable who because of COVID, because of the exasperation of pre-existing conditions have felt uncomfortable and felt called to get in the streets and the Black Lives Matter movement has been a place for them to put that energy, suddenly they won't feel as compelled. Uh, and, and when I finished watching that vice presidential debate, part of what was revealing also for me was, while I feel like people are more civically engaged, that was not the conversation. The conversation was the two minutes and 19 seconds that a fly was on, um, on uh, Pence's head and not a deep dialogue of the implications of this election and the need regardless of who wins to stay in the streets, to stay organizing and doing the work that changes the terrain, not just the players in the terrain. Uh, David, I, I'd like you to weigh in uh, and talk a bit, if you want to pick up on any of what, what uh, uh, Nikita said, do that, but just the work that you and Charles are doing and why it's important and long-term, what, what do you hope to achieve? Well, I think uh, we, we both need to, we, this is us together. So I <laughs> need my, my partner in this one. Charles but, uh, but we are ready for this election to be over. We have been ready for a long time, but we of course are hoping that Biden and, and Harris win. But this is just, it's a necessary step, but it's, it's a step in a long journey ahead of us. And we, we know that the work after this is, uh, is vital, is substantial. We're not interested in the vote. We're interested in voting justice. And you don't get to racial justice in America without voting justice. It's part of the journey along the way there. And so every day after this election, we've got to do the work. We got to be here for not only every election, we got to be here for redistricting that that's going to occur in, in states around the country. We got to be here for what are we going to do with the census? How are we going to how are we going to solve this situation with the census? Are we going to be able to do something about this if Biden and Harris get elected? What are we going to do about the electoral college in this country? Because that's an unjust environment that goes all the way back to enslavement, right? as does 90% of this country. And so the reality is that we've got to be doing this work every day afterwards in terms of our work. Charles, you're, this is, I'm, I'm singing your story, I know. So you, 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 <laughs> I know, and so you, he's referencing, uh, when I met David, I had no idea who he was. And I, I told him the only way I'm joining this organization is if we, we solve for two things. One, we got to get more people who look like me in the room. It wasn't a lot of folks in the room at the time. And two, we got to think beyond 2020 because the, the reason why we're here is because the, the folks just are, are focused on what's going on. Um, I, I think I share, I share your, your fears, Nikita. And I, I, but they're, to me, they're, they're not so much fears. I feel, I feel like it's a certainty. I think that after this election um, with a, a Biden-Harris victory, some folks are going to drop off. And that's just, I feel some of that is just human nature. I think people get super excited and then they, they, there is an ebb and flow. And the honest, the, the honest to goodness part about this with the way folks have mobilized now is that some of it's not sustainable for people. Some folks are hitting the streets more than they should probably. Some folks are sacrificing a lot more relationships, mental health stuff. And people do, they need to pull back. They need to pull back. We had a discussion with our our, our team leads, the folks who lead the work in individual states. And I told them, I said, you gotta promise me that you're gonna give it your all and then you're gonna pull back. I need you to pull back because I need you to sustain this fight long. And the way we sustain this is you have to take care of yourself and you gotta take care of your family and your community. That you can't just leave it all out in the field as we talk about in this like sports reference world. The other thing about this that, that gives me hope though is that I think in this moment, there, there are some real uh, uh, structural pieces that are being built. Some of these are, are digital. We're seeing um, on the progressive side, some of them are straight up democratic, big D democratic, uh, funding infrastructures and organizing infrastructure that was not there before. Um, in 2010 and, uh, and, and, and in the run up to 2016, the Democrats got beat up and down the ticket by uh, better mobilized, better equipped, better funded Republicans. And that is, is changing. That's changing a, a, a ton. And so we're seeing some of that stuff because the votes matter. Even if 
we are not, our organization is not aligned with the Democrats. Um, we, we do understand that a victory on the Democratic side is necessary for positive change. Uh, th there are also a bunch of grassroots efforts like KCEN, where it's not just mobilization in the streets, it's data on the back end, it's, it's infrastructure put in place around organizing and activism to, to specifically sustain it. And we've learned a lot of that stuff, not just from elders like, like, uh, like Gossett um, and folks like my pops, but also from a lot of us coming up through uh, the private sector, through education, doors that were opened up by folks like that. And we've taken that knowledge and carried it into, um, into this movement in this moment. So can, can I jump in here real quick, Enrique? Yeah, please do. Do you have a second? So, I mean, this, this is how I see it. This is hyper-localized. I know we got people all the way from New Hampshire and everything watching, but hyper-localized right here. Fundamentally, what I think the pro, what, what's going to happen is that there's a lot of people, the, 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 the movement to bring awareness to the value of black lives has brought in a lot of people who, who are energized to see Trump leave office, right? And it's brought in a lot of energy. And really, I mean, Trump's energized a lot of people on his own, even before all that, but it's brought in a lot of people. But what I fear is gonna happen is this, is that in the central district, there's more than three, but I got my big three. These are the big three issues right here. Uh, the, the gap in, in, in income between black and white. Black people, black household, $42,500 uh, annually. White household, $105,000 annually. Home ownership in constant decline in Seattle and in King County. Home ownership is a key to generational wealth. You know, black people press reset every generation because all we're passing on is debt. And the third thing is the education gap, the, the, the performance gap between black students and white students in Seattle Public Schools is one of the lowest in America. Now, November 4th, you know, after the election, how many people are still going to care about these issues right here that systemically need to change? These are, if you tell, I'm telling you, if we get better jobs, if we can close the income gap, if we can get back in the right direction of home ownership, if our schools can serve black students, believe me, black people will take care of themselves. And so the, the worst thing that could happen, the absolute worst thing that could happen here in the city of Seattle, is when we talk about all these people are energized to vote and then if if biden wins on the ticket black people are still left in this lurch white people are going to say hey we did our part we got out and voted we got trump out of office but these systemic issues that still plague our community here in the central district of seattle and the south end of seattle will remain and continue in decline and so i would say that for all i can speak of is for converge as a central district we, we serve the black community in seattle so i'm gonna speak specifically to that is it like you know i mean charles has a point as in throttle yourself but maybe your throttle goes from in the streets to on online. But don't just walk away because, you know, this this is a problem that has plagued our community now for decades and decades and we're in constant decline. And like I said, the worst thing that could happen is the day after the election, people are like, oh, I did my part. And us black folk is still stuck in this bad situation. Let me throw well, this out. Can what I just if, throw, what, on, what, there? Can I just throw on there? You know, I, I also think, Omar, I 100% agree with you. And I think folks need to think about their relative privilege in, in space. Um, I see queer, trans, black folks, I see economically disenfranchised folks, I see people who are systematically kept out of spaces as the ones in the streets going full throttle right now as the ones like even on my team that I work on with King County Equity Now with Decriminalize Seattle, it is majority uh, cutie BIPOC uh, non-binary folks doing the work and we are going full throttle and we are going to burn ourselves out. The question of sustainability is really about those who have an interest in maintaining the system of privilege and oppression because it does ultimately serve them in a centrist government, which is what Biden and Harris will bring. Those are the folks who actually need to not pull back because they've never been full throttle. They've never been at the place where they're not economically sustainable, where they're struggling with racism, classism, sexism, uh, homophobia, xenophobia. The folks that are always under those thumbs, under those knees of oppression are the ones that are 24 seven going full throttle because our thriving, our living depends on it. It's the folks whose thriving and living does not depend on systemic change that we actually need to stay engaged. And my fear is those are the exact folks that will pull back and it'll be the same people who are struggling under the thumb of oppression who will remain in the streets, who will remain doing the work. And it's just not sustainable for us to go full throttle 365 days a year. 
So what if Biden and Harris don't win? I mean, let's face it, nobody expected Trump to win last time around. And uh, I can remember that election night quite well. Amari? Yeah, let me let me let me hop in here. Because I mean, yeah, there's there's politics. There's politics that are national and we see Trump, Biden, whatever. But you know what? What impacts black people the most in the city of Seattle are local politics. Let's talk about this. You know, it's been Democrats who have been in office down there in City Hall for decades and decades that have overseen the constant decline of black people in this city. These are local politics that impact us. These are local people, a mayor, a city council, tax systems and everything else, school boards and all these other things. These are the things that are impacting us on the every day in walking through the central district. These gaps that we talk about, this income inequality in the central district can be solved within our municipality, not Washington, D.C. This issue of gentrification, this, this plague, the central district and black people in our community pushed us down to less than 10% in a neighborhood where it used to be 80% can be solved in our municipality. This education gap that we see in the city of Seattle, but the, the underachievement of black students can be solved in our municipality. Whether Trump wins or Biden Wins. We need to keep an eye on our prize right here in our neighborhood. Our zip codes 98144, 98122, 981121, 98118, and everything else. So, you know, for, for me, it's when people put everything in Washington, D.C., that's also pushing away responsibility to take care of home first. And if we said no matter what, we're going to see improvement in our community and we're going to put our community first, it don't matter who wins the White House because so many of these decisions are made locally. Well, as they say, all politics are local, or most of them anyway, at least what people care about. And I think that comes down to, uh, you know, these are the issues that we see every day here locally, and they're definitely driving us, and, and hopefully we will pay closer attention to those things. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about, okay, what, what's next? And, and okay, we, we're, we're in this period now where elections and the, the, the vote has already started. Millions have already voted, and we'll see what happens there. Um, but I think the, the bigger decision is, is I, or question is, what we have to work at is how do we, what do we do to maintain our democracy or make our democracy better going forward? What can we do? Nikita, I'm going to throw it out to you. Yeah, I really appreciate Omari for highlighting local politics. Uh, you know, I ran for office after Trump was elected. And that was because community, literally it was asked by community members to run because there was nothing we could do about the federal level, but it was very clear that if we could shift uh, elections at the local level, shift policies and make systemic change at the local level, we could actually make serious change for marginalized and disenfranchised communities in our region. Um, Seattle has a $6.1 million budget. King County has an $11.1 million budget. And we've been in a state of emergency around housing for almost six years. Uh, and Omari gave incredibly important statistics about wealth. I think what we really need to be doing is, is thinking about how organizing leads to accountability. When we look at what's happened with the Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle is closer than any city to actually making significant strides towards changing the way in which we think about public health and public safety. We've actually had an effective defund. It's only 2%, two, 2%, but 2% has had, has had an important impact. And if our Seattle City Council is willing to, to take that 2% and translate it into the 2021 budget, we might actually see a significant defund from the Seattle Police Department and an investment in public health and public safety that actually works for everyone in our city. So I think what's important is that we get a grip on how movements actually change the lived experience and material conditions of those most impacted by an inequitable system. Changing who is in office is important. That being said, if there are not movements, then we only see accountability every election year. And to be quite frank, without movements, grassroots movements and effective organizing, we will never get candidates in place. And those, those, that, that work has to happen in between election years. We'll never get candidates in place that actually have truly progressive intentions beyond progressive words. Um, and I've seen in the chat some folks talking about how the specific Pacific Northwest is viewed as like this bastion of uh, progressive work. But reality is 
many of our, our electeds are centrist. They cater to the majority white and wealthy population of the city of Seattle and ignore the fact that if we want a healthy, safe city, you actually have to pull from the margins and lift from the bottom, ensuring that those who have had the least access to health and safety actually have access to those things will make the city safer and healthier for everyone. So um, I think moving forward, regardless of who wins, because to be quite frank, I think after November 3rd, things are going to be bad no matter what. You're either going to have Trump supporters that are in the streets, armed like militias, doing wild things, or we're going to have folks, uh, you know, having to fight fascism in the streets the same way we have for the last four years. So no matter what organizing and movements are going to be key and foundational to creating the level of accountability and taking protests and turning it into legislative change that's necessary to serve those most disenfranchised communities. Are the rest of you concerned that we might see some violence in the streets after the election? Anybody? Man, I... It's, it's unpredictable. This is a volatile situation that, that's, that's being pushed towards volatility. Um, you know, un, unfortunately, what we're seeing here, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a possibility. We, we already see violence in the street and there hasn't been an election. You know, we, 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 are, we, already, we are already seeing it. Um, certain elements of people want to go out and, and be violent and everything else. So, I mean, the chances of it are definitely there. We haven't seen an election. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, right? I was having a conversation with, with my, my mom about, you know, it's American to counter protest. People protest, you counter protest. And, and other things, other things, not usually violent. People even protest whether you should build a new library or not build a library, different sides of the street. Only on the protest about the value and humanity of black people do things become armed and violent. Only when it comes to something like that, fundamental things of human rights, that things become violent, where people feel like, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's a life or death thing. So for, for me, I, I'm hoping that there's no violence, but we already see spats of violence across the country before this election. And unfortunately, I think that there might be some incidents, but I'm, I'm hoping for the best. Charles, if I could just correct myself real quick, sure. it's 6.1 billion and 11.1 billion. I mean, 17.2 billion dollars in our region uh, is for for me is such an obscene amount of money to not have addressed the housing affordability and homelessness crisis. Uh, that it is hard for me to, honestly, as a normal person who still is a renter and has tons of educational debt, to imagine billions, you know, uh, above millions, you know, like thousands is a huge amount of money to me. And so, like, that's an obscene amount of money in our region to be having the, the wealth inequality and lack of access to just basic necessities and needs that we have in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. David and Charles, I'd like you to weigh in on the... The last question I kind of raised just about the specter of concern about some violence or anything that you guys might have hear with the with the folks that you're talking with. Yeah, I think I think violence for sure either way. Um, and, and like Omari said, we've seen signs of this already. Uh, if Trump wins, uh, his folks will feel like they have uh, a blank check to do whatever they want in this country to whomever they want. Um, and and it, that it'll just increase. Uh, if if Trump loses, th th their folks will feel like that's my daughter. Their <laughs> folks will feel like uh, she didn't like what you were saying. There you go. I know she's worried too. Yeah. She's worried too. Um, their, their folks will feel like uh, they 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 need to revolt, and mm -hmm. they and they will not work within the system. I um, we're a part of uh, a kind of a loose coalition of folks around the country that are organizing in black and brown communities. And that's one of the things that we talked about was, you know, what, what happens after this? We got to mobilize. We got to get in the streets. And I, I really think if um, – I don't think we do right away because I, I worry for folks out there um, right after the election uh, because violence is going to pop off. And especially if it's not an overwhelming victory by, by Biden, um, if it's contested, I think it's going to be some, some craziness out there. Uh, and that's without like a ton of data. This is like, you know, is there going to be violence? I think we've all seen the news, um, but who knows? David? 
Well, I think that the, the, the reality is that the greatest threat internal to this country, uh, the outside, uh, let me say this again, the greatest uneven addressed tr threat at all because the president where he's taken us is domestic terrorism. And it's largely from the right. It's, it's, it's from an issue of folks that we call militia and that's a term we all use, but in reality are terrorists, they are. And th they are folks who have been given the license to walk around in ways that terrorize us with their weaponry and then to use those to use those. And so those folks are, are getting a license. They have been given a license from this president for three and a half years. And every single day right now, he's given them a further license to, 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 do, to, do, to act upon their violence. So yes, I think it's gonna happen. And then I just, maybe just cause I wanna, I wanna make sure I get this piece in. Um, Enrique and then everybody else who I'm honored to be on this panel with. Uh, the reality is that white guys like me need to start making some fundamental changes in our society, where the reality is that we aren't just doing work. We have to be willing to give up pieces in ways that are more equitable. We have to make structural changes. And that comes from like, hey, I'm a privileged professor at the University of Washington. That is about as privileged as you get as a tenured faculty member at the UW. And what I learned a couple of years ago was how important it was to not just think about this, but to daily live it, to live it on a daily basis. And that comes with the work I do. It comes with how I spend my time. It comes with the organization that Charles and I co-lead in terms of our leadership team. It comes with the money that we raise and how we use it, the communities we partner with. It's got to be in all of those ways. So for everybody who's watching this, who looks like me at all, this is on us fundamentally in some ways that we have not owned to this point. Well, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but I'm, uh, I'm fearful, just like a lot of other folks are these days, that it could. And, uh, you know, Nikita, can you, I, I was trying to uh, put up the little, uh, the thing that you had put in chat that James Baldwin said, can you repeat that for me? Because I... Yeah, uh, James Baldwin said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. Uh, and I personally feel like that, that quote deeply frames uh, for me why sometimes the, the struggle has to have a hard line. That if, if centrism, and, I, and to be quite frank, Biden and Harris, <laughs> represent in many ways the continuation of many forms of deeply entrenched oppression in the United States. Many electeds in Seattle King County have been holding that particular line as well for a long time. And I think we have to get to the place where we accept that when we push for the kind of change that actually forces a, a space rooted in white supremacy to actually acknowledge the humanity and human dignity of people who from the inception of this country have been treated as property, uh, we're going to be in a space where there will be anger, fear, and feelings of disenfranchisement. And it is important for folks like David, and I appreciate you bringing this up, to actually be actively organizing in those communities which they represent which stand to benefit from a continuation of dehumanization, dehumanization of Black, Native, queer, trans folks. Yeah. Um, we're at about 75 minutes in. I thought maybe we would uh, wrap some things up here. Uh, I'd like to, can you guys give me a little hope <laughs> going out here? Uh, this last few minutes have been a little uh, jarring and concerning, but I guess, you know, that is the real deal. That's what we got to be concerned about these days. But um, do you have hope for our democracy? Man, you know, yeah, well, I'm just an optimistic person. People, people, people would be bugging because you know I'd be it's because you're an unlikable guy. That's why. Yeah, <laughs> I, well, they'd be bugging because I get tear gassed and, and pepper <laughs> spray covering a story at two a.m. and they'd be back on the morning show at eleven a.m. Like, hey, how are you? They'd be, you know, I press reset every day, so I'm an optimistic person. But like, man, there, there's a, there's a few things, and in me, you know, nationally, I guess is a whole nother kind of discussion. But man, locally, we've got an opportunity right here. Last year, um, the House unanimously passed, House Bill 1918, unanimously, both houses, people, 
people agree that like there's been systemic racism towards uh, the, the people of the Central District. It was signed by Jay Inslee. That now, so when people say like, hey, black people have been getting systemically pushed out, it's not just us overreacting, being angry black folks. You know, it's, it's there, it's signed. You know, every legislator in the state of Washington agreed. Uh, so we've got, a, we've got a, a baseline platform right there. So now people just can't say that we're angry and imagining things, right? Two, I mean, we've identified these key points. Now, the, the solutions might not be simple, but we know, man, the income gap. We know generational wealth. We know education. How do we address those? Yes, there, there, there's a route for that through, through politics, but there's also a route through that through the everyday citizen. When you talk about people, the, the, one of the biggest challenges in Seattle are the people who are in a position to do something, but they stay quiet. What can people do? Somebody like me converges here because I worked overseas 20 years almost in a world of experience. I couldn't get an entry-level job here, not even get an interview. What can somebody do? Are you a hiring manager? When you see a funny name like mine, maybe give it a second thought. You know what I'm saying? Everybody wants to hire me now, but you know the, the boat is sailed. Man, if, if don't move to the Central District. It's all good. Move somewhere. That's a choice you can make. Also, you know, the, these PTAs are struggling. Rainier Beach PTA, Garfield PTA. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to have a kid in Seattle public schools, but you can be part of that. Man, take the politicians out of the equation. Let's see how we can circumvent City Hall. How can we as the citizen stakeholders in our city make our city better without going through downtown? How can we cut them out the process? Because, man, they always let us down. Now, if they come through with the alley-oop, fantastic. But we can't depend upon City Hall to make our city better. We have, as citizen stakeholders in the Emerald City, we have to get engaged. And what I've been seeing here, at least through our Converge platform and everything else, is the level of engagement is on the rise. So that's what I'm hopeful for. More people care about more things right now. And it's, it's not just sound bites. People are coming out, they're listening, they're getting engaged. And man, let's just see what we can happen. So I'm optimistic, but I'm always optimistic. Hey, we need it. David, Charles, you guys want to weigh in? I, um, I mean, we talked a lot about local politics and uh, common power is not as, as active locally. I'm going to say that the national politics matters in the same way that um, to, to a, a young, young kid looking at the NBA, how that matters. I think that national politics um, teaches a lot of folks things. I think people digest the the fly on Pence's head and they, and that's kind of like entry level political stuff to them. And they care about that stuff or they, they know about it first and then they get activated in that way. Some, some folks activate locally for sure. But I think a lot of people are, are taught about this stuff. They dialogue online about the national political stuff. Um, they've gotten active with CP with our organization um, fighting for, for, for places that they hear about um, on the news and then they come back ready to go. Um, in 2018, when we were formed, it was all in-person stuff. It was no digital anything. It was, it was no texting or calling folks. We would hop on planes and we would go over and knock on doors in these other places. And people would come back and continue to volunteer. They were, these were milestone moments for some of these people. Um, and they brought that stuff back home. So um, I, I, think, I think national politics matters too. A Voting Rights Act, we talked about that. The Supreme Court is on everyone's mind right now. National laws do have an impact on what goes on in, here in Seattle. Um, the monopolies that are going on at the, at, the, uh, at the business level that we've got to break up, uh, a ton of things that, uh, that, that have been talked about over the, this, this presidential season that we've seen this year. Um, but we're, we're going we're gonna to stay in it. Voting is through the roof. Turnout is, is, is bonkers right now. And it's just I'm hopeful for, for all the folks that are out there standing in line. Um, and being individual heroes. David, you wanna add anything? I, I think that there's a lot that we can do when we show up that, um, that everybody in this panel exemplifies about the importance of that. Uh, at Common Power, we've been part of three states in which uh, the work in three states where they have ended lifetime disenfranchisement for felony incarceration in Florida, in Kentucky, and in Iowa. And in every one of those instances, the lifetime disenfranchisement that has been in place is overwhelmingly because of the racist legal system that we have. It's overwhelmingly disenfranchised people of color, particularly men. We've been part of that. 
We've been part of progressive victories in a number of states. We hope to be part of a whole bunch more this time and then after those to get voting reforms enacted at the federal level, to get anti-poverty legislation passed, to get climate justice addressed in a new way. None of those probably are gonna be as far reaching as, um, as anybody here wants, but they are steps in the right direction. And those pieces, uh, you, got, you, you gotta believe that those can happen, otherwise you don't get up in the morning. I appreciate Omari saying he resets every day. That's a choice. That's a choice that we get to make every single day. And as tired as we might be, the reality as leaders is I believe that's, part, that's gotta be part of our DNA. So I uh, started this conversation with you, Nikita. I'm going to give you the last word, too. Thank you. Um, I think the first thing I would say is voting is a baseline uh, to participation. And uh, there are many who, many residents who, for different reasons, will never get to vote. And so I think it is important. Our hope is not in our vote. Our hope is actually in our commitment to movements our commitment to mutual aid, seeing so many people during this pandemic find ways to support their neighbors, to build networks. Oh, fuck. She's, uh, financial a support yeah. has been, which has been one of the most encouraging. I'm back now. <laughs> mutual aid is one of the most encouraging things to me that can be occurring. It's how we take care of each other is actually is is what will make change it's what will make our movements effective it's what will ensure change so i would encourage folks find a place to volunteer find a way to be in relationship with your neighbors if you have some aspect of privilege you need to be the organizer in your community um and don't don't give up after whatever happens on november 3rd know that your showing up is actually you know as cliche as it is we have to be the change we want to see if you want to see something different, be about something different. Um, and that's where we're going to find our hope. All right. Hey, I really appreciate you guys taking a Saturday night to be with me to have this conversation. Not always an easy one, but I think an important one and very timely right now. I'll leave you with this. All right. I got my ballot today. I'm going to fill it out and take it to the ballot box. And uh, so Leonard, over to you. Okay, well, Enrique, I love your I love your face mask, and thank you, Enrique Cerna, for once again moderating a really essential conversation. And what a remarkable panel! I, I second what Enrique said. Thank you for making time on a Saturday night. Uh, you are all inspirational, Charles, David. Nikita, Omari, that's alphabetical order because you're all equal stars. Um, and thank you also to Larry Gossett. I'm okay, thank Larry for us for sharing his wisdom and his reflections. And I want everyone to know that that, our, that film will be an archival piece of the Mohai record because he has great wisdom. The conversation tonight was possible only because of the leadership support of Real Networks Foundation for Culture and Mohai's many supporters and we thank you all. And by the way, if you've learned something new or been inspired by our conversation tonight, please consider joining Mohai because we have lots of conversations like this. You'll also see as you log off tonight a chance to even donate support to Mohai and we always appreciate that. Well, Enrique mentioned, but I'll say it again, Wednesday evening, October 21st at 6.30 is our History Cafe, and that is coming up. Um, and we're going to focus on the history of El Centro de la Raza, um, as well as, um, let me get down here on my screen, I'm blanking on my screen here, as well as our upcoming Democracy Dialogues. These are intimate conversations with people who are change makers. One's coming up on November 14th, the, another on December 12th. So we'll find out the results of the election and what we need to do to keep democracy working, no matter what the results are. It would be remiss of me, as Nikita reminded us, not to say to folks to be sure to vote. It is our basic democratic right and responsibility. And with that, I thank you all again. Thank you for joining us this evening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and good night.